Hello everybody and welcome to Resettled, A Human Journey, ECDC ACC's premier podcast. My name is Yariana Rodriguez and in the spirit of Black History Month, this episode will center on the African immigrant experience in the United States. For this episode, we are excited to have with us Dr. Niambi M. Carter, Assistant Professor in the Political Science Department at Howard University. Dr. Carter earned her PhD in Political Science from Duke University, working primarily in the area of American politics with a specific focus on race and ethnic politics, black politics, public opinion, and political behavior. Her work has appeared in the Journal of Politics and in the Journal of Women, Politics, and Policy, to name a few. And in 2019, her book, American While Black, African Americans, Immigration, and the Limits of Citizenship, was published by Oxford University Press. She is the recipient of a host of awards and fellowships from organizations such as the Ford Foundation. Dr. Carter is also a native of PG County, Maryland. <laughs> So, Dr. Carter, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would like to start off by asking you to reflect on Black History Month. Um, what does it mean to you on, in this day and age, especially in this socio-political climate? And how do you celebrate or commemorate Black History Month? So, let me first say thank you for having me. Black History Month, I think, is one of those things we do now because it's become sort of part of a cultural touchstone. It's a great way to market products, et cetera. Yeah. But I think the spirit of Black History Month was trying to think through, at least for Dr. Woodson, Carter G. Woodson, who founded Black History Week, or Negro History Week at the time, was trying to think about a way to uplift black folks in a community, in a culture, in a society that doesn't actually appreciate people of African descent at all. If you think about the sort of longer arc of history, Black History Month had really been I think a moment for black people to think about our collective goods, like think about our real value and what we add to American society, to this culture. And I think in some places we could argue there probably would be no American culture if it were not for people of African descent. So for me, I think about Black History Month every single day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, being at Howard University is kind of hard not to because it's all around us. Uh, I think it's also easy to take it for granted because it's all around us, but I think Black History Month gives me the permission, I think, and others the permission to really meditate deeply about what it means to be a black person and to talk about that in a very self-conscious way and in ways we don't do on a day-to-day -day basis, I mm -hmm. think, in some spaces. So that's what it means for me. And do you think a month is enough to do that? Absolutely not. <laughs> I think everybody knows a month is not enough, but I do think it's at least an important place to start mm -hmm. and I think we've been here for multiple decades so we perhaps need to think about extending it but I think that we've now seen with the popularity of the month idea with Native Americans, with Latino folks, with women, with LGBTQ folks and others that the month is an important gesture, it's a symbolic gesture and by no means I think is it a place to stop but it's a place to begin. And I think that's what we should probably think about with all of these sort of commemorative months. That mm -hmm. it's a place to begin, not a place to stop. Yeah, I love that because I think a lot of people think, okay, we did that, so we're good, you know? <laughs> um, and it's, we have to continue that conversation and we have to continue the progress. So can you talk to us about your journey of becoming an academic in the field of race and identity politics? How does the immigration narrative play a role in this? So for me, I knew I wanted to be an academic because I was a person who watched a different world mm -hmm. coming up. And I knew that was something I wanted to do. I didn't know how to do it, but it was something I wanted to do. So my becoming a professor was something I thought about since I was 13. So when I got to high school, actually, uh, at Eleanor Roosevelt High School in Greenbelt, Maryland, <laughs> they had this pilot program and I did an internship at the National Archives. Oh, wow. And my mentor there was a, a guy named Dr. Walter Hill. He's a historian. He's no longer with us. But he really helped me think about the steps I needed to take. So I knew I needed to go to college at a mm -hmm. minimum. And I knew I needed to get a PhD if I really wanted to work in academia. Then I go to college and I had this whole host of amazing mentors. Dr. Sonia Peterson Lewis in the Department of African American Studies. Uh, Dr. Betty Collier Thomas in the Department of History. I mean, these women really helped me see what it means 
to be an academic. Not only did they show me how to do research, but they actually showed me how to do research. Like, this is how you look up archives, and this is how you do all this stuff. And they wrote me letters of recommendation, and they did all the other things that you do. So then I get to graduate school, and I meet my graduate school mentor, uh, Dr. Paula McLean, who is still a mentor of mine and, and now a colleague, which is a crazy thing to say. But she was the one that actually introduced me to this set of questions. Because one of the things that was happening in Durham, North Carolina, like in a lot of places, was the Latino population was starting to grow. At the same time, the black population was also starting to grow because we had black reverse migration from the North and the West mm -hmm. back to the South. Yeah. And there was all of this stuff around race that was happening. And I was a part of her research team. So when I got to do my own research, I was really thinking about, well, what does this mean for black people? Like, how are black Americans thinking about immigration? How are they processing this issue? And there really was no answer for me in my discipline and in the literature that I was satisfied with. So that's how that became the thing, uh, the immigration issue sort of made its way into into my work. I really saw it as dovetailing with all these other issues that black Americans were struggling with and thinking about and thinking through. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to, to just say how, how critical it is to have a mentor in your life, mm -hmm. especially when you go through all those changes. Here um, as a resettlement agency, we have a first friend program just to get mentors for our families because we know that regardless whether it is that you're trying to progress professionally or in education, sometimes you just need somebody to talk to, somebody just to go through with the motions mm -hmm. with you. Um, so that's a really important part of their growth, mm -hmm. I believe. So congratulations Thank you. on your book that was published just last year. Um, can you tell us a little bit about it? Okay. So this is an extension of where I started professionally in terms mm -hmm. of my dissertation. And one of the things that I, again, have been struggling with is how do black people understand immigration? And we've seen moments like President Trump when he was running for office telling black people, you know, Hillary Clinton doesn't care about you. She's exporting these jobs and she's making it so that these immigrants can come and mm -hmm. take your jobs. And we've heard this narrative okay, about yeah. taking jobs and taking jobs and taking jobs. And what struck me about that that was so wrong is that I just knew in my gut that that would not be the persuasive narrative mm -hmm. for black people. And I knew that in part because I felt like I know black people. My family's black. We talk. <laughs> and I never heard anybody say anything like what Donald Trump was suggesting. Or even other people, because he's not the first, of course, to suggest that immigrants take jobs. That's a common trope. Yeah. And what I was trying to argue is that immigrants are a really important vehicle. Immigration is a really important vehicle for blacks to talk about their own grievances and their lack of inclusion and incorporation in the body politic. So when you see black opinions on immigration, what I was arguing is what you really see is black frustrations with white supremacy. Yes. And immigrants are low-hanging fruit. They're easy, right? It's easy to say that immigrants take jobs, but what people really know is mostly true is that somebody gave them a job, mm -hmm. and they gave them that job because they're easy to exploit. So we racialize things that really at the base are about economics and are about power. And we don't really attack the foundations that make it possible. And for many black people, even if they say things that look, I would say, anti-immigrant, what they're really talking about is white supremacy. Mm -hmm. Because white supremacy is making sure everybody is oppressed. So even if I feel like an immigrant person has come here an immigrant person is able to get a foothold in American society before me. It's not about that person. It's about what white supremacy does. And that is what's operating here. So that's my book in a nutshell. Oh my God. I would, I would <laughs> love to have a professor explain that to me through my college years because it's, it's just not something that we really get into the nitty gritty of. We just have a feeling and we, you know, act, you know. So I, I think that would be. That would have been great to have <laughs> um, during my education. So bringing it closer to home, how have you observed attitudes 
towards African immigrants over the past few years in the DMV area? Well, you know, growing up in the DMV, I think it's a little unusual because there are so many migrants, mm -hmm. immigrants of all stripes from the Caribbean, from South America, from West Africa in particular. And so it's not like other places that are like, oh, these people are new. It's like, no, this has been my life. Like I grew up eating Ethiopian food. One of my best friends, I hate to say this, one of my best friends is um, her family are immigrants uh, from Sierra Leone, but it's true. It's very much a part, I think, of this region and this experience. And I think to a certain extent, the attitudes here are like in a lot of places which is we're fine as long as they're fine. Um, I think you do see sometimes people being concerned that immigrants view themselves as better or different than African Americans, right, native born blacks. But again, I think that's sort of idle conversation because when we look at things like people's attitudes about whether the government should be doing more enforcement, they're really, black Americans aren't really in favor of those kinds of measures. And I think it's because those kinds of measures are also dangerous to native born blacks. So when we're talking about increasing things like police surveillance to make capturing undocumented people easier, we're mm -hmm. also talking about communities that are used to being over-policed. We're also talking about meeting that same surveillance on those same communities. So I think people are reluctant to draw that uh, to their communities. That said, I think that people have a sensibility that immigrants actually do bring something to the community. I think that there are going to be tensions, but there are tensions that are somewhat about immigration status, but just what happens when your community yeah. is growing and changing in ways that feel foreign to you, for lack of a better term. I mean, this area is in the midst of a gentrification. That hurts everybody, even people who are not native born. Uh, this, this community is very expensive. Yes. That hurts everyone. The cost of food. Everybody's interested in education for their children and making sure their kids have the best possibility at a future. So I think around those issues, most people agree and coalesce. I just think the, the, the sort of day-to-day -day stuff is always difficult. But here, I would say in particular, people's attitudes, I, I would say are fairly liberal around immigration because we know what an immigration enforcement regime can look like. And I think it's worth noting that Prince George's County is a sanctuary county. D.C. is a sanctuary city. Baltimore City is a sanctuary. And I think those are important things to keep in mind because I think that says something. You have these majority or at least plurality black places that are saying we don't want this kind of draconian policy in our, in our borders. And I think that's an important signal sender. And, and these areas have been sort of pioneers in that. Mm. That's good to hear in this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's a, it's a yeah. dangerous time. Yes, it, it is. It's a very dangerous time. And we have a, an administration that mm. is very clear that it has no compunction about ripping apart families and mm -hmm. sending people to detentions. And when we look at black immigrants in particular, we know that they're more likely to be caught up in sort of petty petty crimes or petty events and take plea deals and other things that make it more likely that their immigration status will be um, even more fraught and that it's likely that they will be deported for a misdemeanor. So we have to always be thinking about, about this stuff right now. I mean, we should always be thinking about it, but right now it's very critical and we have, you know, these stepped up Africa bands. I mean, they can call them Muslim bands. You can call them what you want to, but you're clearly signaling mm -hmm. that there are certain countries on the continent that you do not want immigrating to the United States, like Eritrea. Right. Naming countries by name, I think, is a hallmark of this administration, but it also is creating, I think, an atmosphere of, of fear. Mm -hmm. And all people of African descent, wherever you come from, should be concerned about that. Yeah. And I mean, speaking on the resettlement side of it, mm -hmm. uh, just comparing one administration to the other, I mean, from the Obama administration, we used to accept anywhere from 80,000 to 110,000 refugees each year. Um, now, under the Trump administration, we are currently accepting 18,000 
Maybe. So there's a big change. Yeah, I mean, Donald Trump mm. and this administration has made it clear that they see no value yeah. in these communities, not even on humane purposes. I think people don't recognize that you know, refugees are not the same thing as the sort of undocumented people that he's talking about, the mm -hmm. people who maybe have overstayed their visa or something like that. You're talking about people who are saying, I can't go home for a very particular reason. That's different. And I think that should give us all pause when we see this rhetoric and it's just ramping yeah. up because it's just thrown everybody into the same basket and sort of no thought to what the real ramifications and the dangers mm -hmm. that exist for people's lives worldwide if we say no you can't come here yeah and i mean immigration in this country is such a complex issue but lately it has become so political so how how can we shift those negative perceptions mm -hmm. what can we do the we is big yeah and i think there's a role for all of us to play and i think one of the most basic things is see the big picture so most of us are not competing with immigrants for jobs. Many people who are coming here, say, with proper documentation, are very highly skilled, very highly educated. So there's a selection bias in our immigration process. So when we're bringing people from India and from Nigeria and from China and other parts of the world, we are bringing the best of the best. So most of us are not competing with them at this level. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at the folks who are the undocumented or that dreaded term illegal that this administration likes to throw around, we're talking about people without skills. And in part, the reason they find themselves in this position is because they don't actually get any points in their selection mm -hmm. because they don't have the requisite education. We don't, they don't have the requisite skills. So many of us are not going to also compete with them. You're talking about day laborers. You're talking about restaurant staff. You're talking about the most easily exploited and the people with some of the most dangerous jobs. So you're talking about people who do concrete mixing and things like that that are, that are dangerous jobs. Mm -hmm. So farm labor. So we're not competing with them either. So I think part of it is we have to take that rhetoric away. We're not competing. They're not taking they're being given positions, and they're being given positions because we know that they are easily to, easy to exploit. Employers know that they can pay them less wages. Employers know that they don't have to protect them, that they can sort of fire them at will, and nothing will come of it. So I think that's one point, part of it. The other part is to think about the human side of it. Folks are leaving homes, perhaps never to go back. Mm -hmm. Not because they want to in many cases, but maybe there is an opportunity for better education. Maybe there is an opportunity to make more wages so you can send home remittances are huge. What must that mean to leave everything you know, to go to a place where you don't know? Maybe you speak the language, maybe you speak it imperfectly, but that is a huge, huge human cost. And I don't think we think about that enough. We just think of these people kind of coming here all greedily, taking up all the largesse, and it's like, couldn't be farther from the truth when you hear some people's stories like, I haven't seen my family for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine not seeing your family for 30 years? And lots of people experience that. Lots of people can't attend funerals. I mean, I think we don't think about immigrants as whole people. We think about them as an idea. And that idea is like they're these sort of parasitic people to come to take, take, take. And the other part of it is just think about facts. And I think that's the other part we don't like, which are facts. <laughs> So the idea that immigrants get to come here and just get all the benefits, and the benefits are paltry to begin with. Oh, yes. But the idea that immigrants just get to come here, they don't have to pay taxes. That's not true. But that's something that's part of a popular narrative. Mm -hmm. Immigrants come, they don't pay taxes. Not true. They get money from the government. Again, not true. Those things we have to dispel. We cannot entertain those lies anymore. The truth is immigrants probably pay far more than most of us for most things, particularly if you're an undocumented person. That makes the cost of everything much more expensive and your life much more precarious. So an apartment might cost you, you know, $1,600, but because this person knows I'm undocumented, they might charge me $2,000, mm -hmm. and what am I going to do about it? Got to figure it out. Or things like getting papers. I mean, again, it's an illegal enterprise, but 
I have to pay through the nose to have real looking documents mm -hmm. so I can actually work. Most immigrant people who are here work. They want to work, that's why they're here. Mm -hmm. They didn't come to sit around, in part because many of them have communities, not just families, that are depending on them making it. So I think we have to, to look at facts, the whole person and the human cost of it, and, and start thinking about, well, how does the system enable this? Because people aren't doing this for nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, H-2A visas are real. Mm -hmm. That happens, and they have poor oversight. We know that people are being asked to do all kinds of labor that is dangerous, it's dirty, and has very little protection. But those H-2A visas are being used by big corporations to bring people in here to do agricultural work and other kinds of work that Americans don't want to do. And that's very real. And it's not that, that Americans don't want to do it, because I don't want to make it seem like Americans are lazy <laughs> and they don't want to work. But they don't want to do it at that cost and at that wage, because we know it's underpaid work. And if you're doing work like cutting up chicken in a poultry processing plant, you need that mesh metal jacket or vest so you don't cut yourself. But we know that that has actually happened and people have cut themselves at work mm -hmm. because they weren't provided basic safety equipment. Americans who have any sort of sensibility about work and OSHA and all these things that are there to protect them in the workplace probably wouldn't accept that. Employers know this. That's why they don't hire you. So I think we have to have to think about about that. Immigrants are coming to feel a very particular niche in the economic market um, and largely because it's been abandoned because that work is dying. Mm. So it's not like they're working in growing fields where there are all these opportunities and yeah. bustling incomes to go with. So that's what I would suggest. Do you think the government is doing anything to better those opportunities or better their lives? Or should they be doing something now um, in this day and age? For immigrant groups? For immigrant groups, yeah. Well, I mean, I think one of the most basic things that the government owes anybody is to come up with a coherent mm -hmm. system that people can actually apply and get legal residence and don't have to wait years. I think we also need to think about the ways in which we incentivize people to come here without documents. Because the reason that people are willing to come here risking being captured, risking their future attempts at a, 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 a legal process of mm -hmm. um, registration is because the process takes too long. Yeah. It's very expensive and it doesn't favor immigrants who don't have a lot of education or skills. So if you are a person who is a laborer yeah. and say you don't have a lot of education because you live in a country where you actually have to pay to go to school, that primary school is not say available for free, then you will probably never be able to become a legal resident. So we have to in we have to incentivize people partaking in the process. It is broken. It has never been coherent. It has never been particularly good. And I think the ways in which people have to make choices about how to whether it's worth participating in the sort of legal system of immigration, we have to think about that. I mean, I think that's the least we owe people. Mm -hmm is an opportunity to come here and live safely. Because when, we, when people are coming without documents, their lives are so precarious and so endangered from so many angles. It's the getting here that's dangerous. But once you are here, we know people are routinely taken advantage of. We know that people are paying more in taxes. We know that people are paying more to live, just doing basic things. And so there wouldn't be a market for undocumented labor if we actually had a mechanism where people could come here safely so that they could claim worker protection, so they could fight against wage theft, all of those kinds of things. So I think that's the least the government owes. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's something that we could see in the next decade? I think it's something we could do. Okay. I don't know that there's the political will mm -hmm. to do it, in part because I think our public discourse about immigration is so bad. So we don't make distinctions between asylees, refugees, mm -hmm. and immigrants. They're not all the same people. We don't actually talk about part of what we need is more staff. 
Right. Like the part of the reason why this takes so long is we don't actually have enough staff. Mm -hmm. So we need more staff and we need to better train probably people on how to make decisions around folks who are say coming from countries that we deem as a security threat. Like how do you tell the teacher from the person who might be a potential threat? Now the truth is we've had more domestic threats than international yeah. threats, but people don't worry about homegrown threats in the way that they worry about international mm -hmm. threats. And of course, the post 9-11 moment, I think, has escalated that worry and I think has made the whole universe mm -hmm. much more difficult, regardless of where in the world you come from. And I think the other thing we have to do is we have to have a real conversation around immigrants that do not come from Europe. Because I think yes, we please. have had <laughs> a very Western European dominated yeah. immigration mm -hmm. structure for a really long time. Mm -hmm. And even though Post-1965, we saw revision, we've seen, excuse me, revisions to our immigration and naturalization process. Part of our anxiety as a nation is the fact that you have immigrants coming from Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa, and they don't speak English, or they're not racially white mm -hmm. in a way that we recognize, and so people are feeling threatened. And now when people are talking about, oh, the demographics in America is going to shift by 2043 and it'll be a majority-minority nation, well, that's already underway in California and Arizona and Hawaii and other places, and I think the hand-wringing about, well, who are we going to be as a nation if we continue to allow these immigrants is why we have not come up with a better process. It doesn't mean that everybody will get in. That's what everybody's like, oh, we don't want open borders. That's not what it's suggesting. But it at least says we are going to come up with an efficient system that won't keep people hanging on for a decade about wondering about what their status is. That is the least we owe people. Mm -hmm. So they can make other decisions. So, okay, I don't get into the United States. Well, maybe I want to go to France. Or maybe I want to go to the UK. Or maybe I want to go to Italy. Wherever. But, I, you know, if America's my first choice and America's kind of playing making coy and making you <laughs> wait and you can't start your process elsewhere mm -hmm. until this process is resolved, mm -hmm. you know, this is, this is ridiculous. Yeah. And just to push that these are people, you know, we're, ta we're talking about somebody's life. So it's like we should take take this a little bit more seriously. Especially yeah. because so many people are the one. Yes. They don't get a lot of bites at the apple in their mm -hmm. family or in their villages, in their communities. Exactly. And these are often community processes. People are pooling money so that you can do this. So this is not something to be taken lighthearted. This is not 90 Day Fiance, it's not a reality <laughs> show, it's not funny. Like said, these are real people's real mm -hmm. lives. And in the meantime, they have to work and do all the things that they have to do in the midst of all this mm -hmm. uncertainty. So it's a... It's and a, life happens, things change, you know? So it's, it's a process that may take a decade. It's, it's very difficult. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen that people who apply and then they get married or they have mm -hmm. kids and it's, well, you have to, this is a whole other process that you have to do. So it's really, it's negative in the way that our immigration system has played mm -hmm. out. Since the beginning, it's been very, to my, in my view, very racist Absolutely. in the beginning. Um, but it's also so complex and I don't think it needs to be so complex. So in your opinion, do you think, or how do you think the African American community feels about immigration in this country? I think African Americans, and I, I don't want to speak for everyone, of <laughs> course, but I mean, from my research and in just sort of being in the world, mm -hmm. I argue that African Americans are very ambivalent. On the one hand, people are afraid, in part because America has never done its level best to make sure that African Americans were truly incorporated into the body politic. I think that's very true. And now we have scholarship that's showing that in every area, from housing to education to property ownership and other things, black people were deliberately kept out, deliberately had their communities undervalued, costing them wealth. So I think black people are rightly afraid that this new group will come in and become the favored group. I think they're very concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think they're concerned too when they get signals sometimes from immigrants that suggest we don't want to be grouped in with you guys and we don't want to be like you. And we have to understand where that comes from. Mm -hmm. White supremacy is global. The image of bad black people is global. 
why would you want to be in with a group that people call criminals and lazy and bad and and these are people who who don't form families and do all the things that people are supposed to do who would want to be grouped in with that so we have to be aware and sort of give people a little grace and recognize they're coming from a different context where the racial learning might be different where they might not be clear on all that has occurred in the United States. Like people have some idea, but they might not know about sort of this history of enslavement and Jim Crow and how that replicated and created mm -hmm. the conditions that black people live in currently. So I think we have to give people a little grace there. And I think people do. I think people recognize that immigrants will go through a learning process and will have to reckon with white supremacy in their own way. At the same time though, you know, black people are open and understand people's desire for self-determination to remake themselves and to become better than they were and to provide for their families and to create opportunities for the kids. Black people understand that. And I think that's why you don't see tons of black people organizing around um, anti-immigrant measures. I think that's why you don't see tons of, say, black organizations, mm -hmm. grassroots organizations like the Urban League or NAACP. Mm -hmm saying things like, yeah, we need to get those people out of here. Because the same energy that seeks to keep out immigrants is the same energy that keeps black people out of, of the public sphere. So black people don't need to and don't participate in furthering that language. So it's a, a very fraught situation. Because when you ask people, do you want more immigrants, they might say no. Because when you ask them, do you want to then spend more money on patrolling the borders, they also mm -hmm. say no. Mm -hmm. So clearly those two things are not compatible. And I think that's what we're witnessing is that a moment where black people have two very strong opinions, but they're going in opposite directions. And I think, again, it's about the anxiety that black people feel about themselves, not about the immigrant group. It's an easy thing to say, oh, black people are angry and they don't like immigrants. Some people, I'm sure, don't. And there are others who are just like, huh, they're here. Mm -hmm. Would I rather them be here? Probably not, but they're not really doing anything to me. And I get it. And I think that's probably more of where you see the opinion going. And are there any places or platforms, spaces where these communities can talk about their fears about immigration? I mean, is it just through education that they can do this or are, is anybody working to just start the conversation in these communities specifically? I mean, I think locally there probably mm -hmm. are efforts. Um, I certainly know um, around Durham when I was there, there were, there were organizations that sort of were working together to bridge that divide mm -hmm. so that people could see themselves more alike and see where they could coalesce because it's not going to be on every issue. Yeah. People will disagree. So you can have coalition around some things, but there are going to be other things where groups fall apart. I think you're likely to see it on a local and in, 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 in community level. I mean, there are certainly organizations um, like BAJI, the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, which are bringing in people, not just immigrant groups, but also uh, black Americans who are interested. I don't know that they do it at the level of community forum, but I've certainly been a part of like webcasts they've had to just sort of make people aware of what the issues are with black immigrants. And I think that's so important because I don't know that people recognize that, you know, the crisis on the border also has impacts on people of African descent. Mm -hmm. It's not just about Mexicans and Hondurans and Ecuadorans and Salvadorans. There's also a lot of Haitians coming that way as well, and they're caught up. So I think little things like that go a long way. I think it also helps when you have organizations like the NAACP and others, for whatever people think about their pull in the community, at least saying, actually, we think this is an important human right. We actually think that the United States needs to do better. We actually think what is happening shouldn't be done. I think that's an important signal sender. Um, a group I'm a member of, the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, have been very um, active in terms of issuing public statements, not necessarily showing up for rallies, but at least issuing a public statement saying we recognize this policy is flawed and it's a problem, and this is why. So I think you definitely see this at community levels and at local levels where people are talking to each other and people are working together. Uh, I think in D.C. where you like have the Commission of African Affairs, I think that was an important step 
to signal to members of the African community broadly considered that in this city you have a home. And not only do you have a home, that we're going to institutionalize what we think is an important community, an important set of relationships that we want to build. And I know they are very active, um, just like there's a commission on African American affairs. And I think those are the, the things that we can do um, to bring that awareness. And I think also talking to people. I mean, in looking over your life and thinking about like all the people you know who are immigrant people. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's not just, you know, the gardener or the mailman or the, you know, these, it's also your dentist. It's also, you know, your, your hairdresser, mm -hmm. your, your, all these intimate relationships you have with people mm -hmm. and, and think about them. I think that's also an important place that we could start in our own lives is just thinking about like, oh, wait, I know that person and that person is from Grenada. Oh, oh wait, I know that person and that person is from Liberia. You know, you know a person that is from some other place. And I will always tell people, keep them at the front of your mind. Would you want them to experience this uncertainty, this danger? Would you want them to experience this harm? And I think that's always a good place to start because, again, if people don't see it in their own lives, it's hard for them to think about it in the larger picture. But if you're living in this area or anywhere, it's hard to say you don't know anybody from some other place even if they're not first generation, right? Like it's hard to say you don't know anybody. And even thinking about domestic migration, mm -hmm. you know, my family, my mom's side of the family, my mom is from North Carolina and moved to DC. That's a migrant narrative. Mm -hmm. And I think we can also keep that in mind as well, that it might be slightly different because it's domestic, but the things that are pushing people out of the South and to the North and to the West are the same things that are pushing people out of the Caribbean in some cases, out of the continent of Africa in other cases, out of out of Latin America in other places. Let's think about that. I can testify to that. <laughs> um, you know, I was born in the Caribbean, Puerto Rico, and yeah, we moved here because jobs. There's yeah. no opportunities. There were no opportunities for what I wanted to do back home. Mm. And it's not like I want to leave home. It's just I have no other choice if I want to progress in my career. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely get it. And, you know, starting my career here in the nonprofit and working with refugees is something that I, I understand where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So to that, why is it that you believe that the current white power structure creates conflicts within minorities? And I know this is a very, this is a very loaded question. <laughs> no, in, in part those are my sympathies and part yeah. of my argument. I think white supremacy is always concerned first and foremost with its preservation. And when you create a racial order where black people are at the bottom and white people are at the top, and it's like a permanent bottom, mm -hmm. I think most people would argue blacks, Native Americans, Others have been in this black space for a long time. And black, let me be clear, does not necessarily mean that you are a person of African descent. I mean as a condition. Mm -hmm. So blackness is not just about whether you are racially or black or racialized as black. It's also about a condition of exclusion. And when you see groups come in and out of this sort of matrix of race, Right, so the Irish at one time were not white, white, but now they are firmly in, in the mm -hmm. white category. You see different groups filter in and out of this sort of binary relationship between black and white, and they face their own ostracization by different processes, whether it's language or complexion or religion. Other people are filtered out, yet that black category seems to hold. And I think. What happens as people are trying to buy for social mobility, that it's a lot easier to blame the person across from you who's in a similar circumstance and say, it's your fault, than it is to look up and say, actually, this is a bigger systemic issue because we don't live in Jim Crow days anymore. It is difficult to point at that law or that institution as discriminating against you and keeping you out. It is a lot easier to look at your neighbor and a person in a similar circumstance and say, it's your fault and you did it. So what white supremacy does, it sort of perverts the conversation because you don't even see it anymore. Mm -hmm. It lives in a place that is beyond questioning. And this foundation is firmly in place. Because we don't ask the question anymore is, why 
in fact, do people push this narrative that black people are lazy? Black people have worked for free for this country for 400 plus years. And then when you think about what happened in the sort of post Jim Crow period, been consistently underpaid, have no wealth as a group, largely speaking. And I'm not talking about the Oprahs and the athletes of the world. I mean, as a community, you're talking about a community that has essentially been bankrupted by these processes of enslavement and theft. And when you look at somebody or a group of people that look like they're doing better than you, and people keep saying, hey, black people, why aren't you doing better? So-and-so came from another country and were able to pull it together. Mm-hmm. They gaslit you into thinking that it's your fault. <clears throat> and of course we can talk about individual cases and individual people who made poor decisions. Like that exists in every group. But nothing like this happens on, a, on an aggregate scale on a cumulative scale like this unless it was done on purpose. What happens to black people in the United States is not an accident. It is a purposeful set of official and unofficial activities that lead black people to where they are in terms of health outcomes, economic outcomes, social outcomes, political outcomes. Yet what white supremacy does is tell black people, tell other groups, it's your fault. You didn't do this right, that's why your group is in this position. Or you're better than this group, that's why you're in this position. Mm-hmm. You work hard. Look, see, you're enterprising. And it pits these groups against each other. And if they're fighting each other, they're not looking at, wait a minute, who does this actually benefit? And I think that is the perversion of white supremacy, is that it is able to hide itself in plain sight. It is able to operate and to function because when we go to say the individual employer says, I'm only hiring Americans, that feels good, probably. It probably means you might have a little job, but that's a firm. Mm -hmm. That's not talking about all of these other spaces where we know, say, immigrant labor is being used and exploited in some cases. So I think white supremacy and this sort of white power structure, if you will, will continue to operate well into 2043, unless we talk about these sort of systemic issues and not the individual hurts and not the individual experience. Because like I tell my students all the time, experience isn't evidence. So yeah. what you experience is not everybody else's I experience. I like that. <laughs> and, and it can be true, right? It could be true that you met that one person who said, I'm not black like you. I'm Nigerian. That doesn't mean all Nigerians feel that way. Mm-hmm. It also doesn't mean that there's no truth there. No, they're not black like you. It doesn't mean that they're saying they don't see themselves in kinship with you. Some people will feel that way. Other people won't. Again, that's an experience. But when we look at the sort of longer trend, we have seen immigrant groups be used as weapons against blacks, whether it was black Pullman porters protesting and and striking about how the Pullman company were treating them and then hiring Filipino laborers to take their places. Whether it is, you know, Southern planters hiring Chinese labor to bludgeon black folks who were saying, we don't want to work for essentially no wages. I mean, they were getting paid very little. Again, it's not the Chinese labor's fault. It's not the Filipino labor's fault. It's the white folks' fault. But if you're focused on, oh, that person is a strike breaker, or oh, that person did this, you can't see that. And so I would ask people to take a step back and really look at who benefits here. Because at the end of the day, they, the immigrant groups want to do the same thing everybody else wants to do, which is work hard and try to make a living and try to put together the best life for yourself and your family and your community. But who benefits if we fight? And I think that's something we always have to think about. And white supremacy is never going to tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, pull the trick on you. It's really me that you're mad at. I mean, and do you think, like, the media is influencing and shifting that focus from white supremacists towards these community and immigrant groups? And what can we do about that? Well, I think the media has always been a sort of handmaiden of white supremacy, to be quite frank. So I think one of the things we can do, even in our own sort of native medias out of our communities, because we can always speak back, I think we have to hold ourselves to a higher standard. And I think we have to hold those people in our communities who say things that we know are reckless and we know are potentially dangerous Mm -hmm. to a higher standard. 
So when we hear people saying things like, well, just because, you know, the country is trending to being more Latino in 24 degree doesn't mean white supremacy will go away. And we need to be careful because these people are having so many babies. We have to be careful of that language. Mm -hmm. We cannot allow members of our community to say things like that. That is very dangerous language. And we don't want to replicate what white people have done to us to other groups. There's no justice in that. There's no righteousness in that. And if our community hasn't learned that lesson, I mean our, I mean the black community writ large, there is no justice in, in replicating the behaviors that white people have had toward us to excluding people, to attacking people. Then we've lost it. We have lost it. We have lost all credibility. We have lost all claims to justice for our group. We cannot afford to do that. And I think part of what we can do is support those media outlets that are talking about things that are in a fair manner, that aren't using the salacious headlines like black people versus Latino people or black people you know, are brutalizing immigrant groups. I remember there was a story when I was in graduate school about how many times Latino immigrants are being robbed by black people. Now, on one hand, you're like, dang, that's terrible. But it's like, why? Why was that the headline? Because it had nothing to do with their race. Mm -hmm. You rob Latino immigrants because you know that many of them don't have bank accounts and they have cash. That's about expedience. Those people could be from anywhere in the world and it wouldn't matter. In the same way, they're robbed by black people because they live in black communities. I'm not going to move across town to go rob somebody. I'm going to rob them because they live next to me. That, again, is not about race. That's about convenience. Mm -hmm. Yet that narrative that you know black people are victimizing Latino immigrants was one that people took and ran with. And I vehemently oppose that kind of talk. Because again, had nothing to do with these people raising everything to do with circumstance. It's because they're a vulnerable community, not because they're Latino immigrants. They're vulnerable because they're Latino immigrants, but it's not because they're Latino immigrants. And it's not because they're black that they rob, because blacks are not criminals. It's because you have people who were going to rob somebody, that was probably already in their heart to do, and they knew this community was easy picking. They live near them. Again, nothing to do with the fact that they were black. So I think we have to resist the urge to report in those kinds of ways mm -hmm. because I think it's super irresponsible. So do you believe that we, as part of these groups, these communities, have a higher responsibility to hold people accountable, especially people who are part of our community? Yes, and I think we have to, again, watch the languages that we are using when we're talking about each other. Like, those people. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. Martin Luther King said something that was really important. He said, you can't thinkify people. Because once you do, it's harder to see them as people, as human beings, with the same impulses and desires. I'm, of course, paraphrasing. But I think that's a really important thing that we all have to watch. Immigrants aren't just one community of people. There are good people in that community. Mm -hmm. There are not so good people in that community. But they're just like us. And I think we have to remember that when we also talk about black Americans. They're not a single community. They're varying parts of that community. Some of them are good. Some of them are not so good. You know, everybody's not a saint and everybody's not a sinner. And I think we have to be very clear, especially when we're talking about perhaps some of the conflicts that arise. What is the basis of the conflict? If the person's race or status doesn't have anything to do with the conflict, then that doesn't need to be part of the story. What is the conflict about? So, yeah, if we're talking about more resources for English as a second language education and people are upset about that, why is that the problem? It's not because people just hate kids having to learn English. Maybe it's about the fact that they feel like their children aren't getting enough resources and attention. So how can we have that conversation in a more nuanced, less sensationalistic way that brings mm -hmm. down the rhetoric a little bit because I think that also can sow seeds of distrust and dissension where they don't have to be. Yes. <laughs> so this has been really a very helpful conversation for me and I hope for all of our listeners. So I do want to end with this final question. How do you think we should be encouraging people to embrace ethnic and racial diversity and why is this important? 
I think it's important because it's inevitable. Our lives are changing, our communities are changing and growing and expanding. And one of the things that I've always loved about black American communities, but black people the world over, is the ability for our communities to expand and the ability to hold lots of people in our communities and, 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 and create space for people. I mean, I just came back from Ethiopia, and that was one of the greatest experiences I've ever had. I've never, I had never been before. Yeah. But one of the things I, I recognize is that there are just some things that black people do, like hug you and feed you mm -hmm. and dance and, and other kinds of things that you see. And it's like, oh, wow, it happens here, too. And I think it affirmed what I already felt which is it doesn't matter where you are in the world. It doesn't matter where you are from. If you are a person of African descent, there is something that holds us all together. Mm -hmm. I think that is a common thread. And it's not because I think, oh, people of African descent are super special and the best people in the world, although I kind of do. <laughs> but I do think this sort of emphasis on community is something that is a common through line. If there was anything that I could say was a carryover from the continent to to the Caribbean, to parts of Latin America, to the United States with people of African descent, that's a through line. And I think that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. I also think it it takes too much energy and effort to go after the community that is easiest to attack. Mm -hmm. Because if you're doing that, it's quite likely that some, some entities, some institutions, some things, some people that are way more powerful are getting let off the hook by doing that. Mm. So I will also urge people to think about what else is there. Ask the next question. Keep probing because it's usually far beyond and far deeper than your neighbor or that other person. And don't give in to the rhetoric. Don't give in to, well, they should speak English. Why? Why does that bother you, how people move in the world and get around the world? Would you want somebody to tell you about your culture and what you could and could not do? Or how you could speak to your loved ones? Or how you could talk to your children? How to worship in your churches? No. So don't do it to other people. I think we have to stop using language that treats other cultures and other communities as mysteries. Say you don't understand something and ask people, why do you do that? Why do you worship this way? What's the significance of this? Don't just go, ugh, that's horrible. Why would they do that? I don't get it. Ask. Because I think a lot of the, the part of it is that people don't know things and they feel ashamed that they don't yes. know. And instead of asking because they don't mm -hmm. want to let themselves in, they say all these really kind of horrible things about mm -hmm. something that they don't know anything about. So mm -hmm. ask. I absolutely love that question. Why? Just because learn something. Don't be afraid to learn something mm -hmm. new. You know, we are not, we are always ignorant of something, but it's to be open to learn something mm -hmm. new that that's what matters, really. And I think oftentimes people are flattered that you ask. Yes. Like, they want somebody to ask. Like, I, oh, you never ask. Like, why do you wear this color when there's, a, when there's an event? And yes. so people can explain, if I'm wearing this color, that means it's a funeral. Mm -hmm. Now you know. Exactly. And I will tell you, I rather have people come up to me and ask me why instead of assuming something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. So if anybody's out there, just please <laughs> ask why instead of just assuming something of somebody you don't know, somebody, somebody's culture, language, um, or community. So before we close, I do want to remind listeners that Dr. Carter's book, American Wild Black, is available for purchase through Amazon. Is it available in any other platform? Yes, it's through uh, Amazon. Mm -hmm. Oxford University Press website Perfect. also has it, oup.edu. So it's available there as well. Um, and anywhere books are sold. Excellent. So that's definitely going to be my next reading. <laughs> Um, Dr. Carter, thank you so much for joining us and for sharing your insight, your very valuable insight. Thank you to our listeners for joining us for this episode. To find out more information, be sure to follow us on social media through Facebook at ECDCACC, our Instagram account at ECDCACCDC Metro, or our YouTube at ECDCACC as well. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you join us next time on Resettled, A Human Journey. Thank you. Thank you.